Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, we're in this wee series this summer called You Ask For It. And uh, some of you asked for a message on what the Bible says about the rapture. And so we started this message a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the rapture and we entitled the message Left Behind and Home Alone. And um, there are actually two events associated with prophecy in the last days that surpass all other events in terms of interest, popularity, and fascination. And the first of those two events is the rapture. And we talked about that over the last two weeks, and that's on the website if you missed it. The second big event is something the Bible calls the tribulation. And the two are linked. The most popular question about the rapture is when will it happen? Will it happen before, during, or after the tribulation? I should say that this is primarily uh, a Western world question or even a North American question. This question gained popularity in the 1970s with Hal Lindsey and his book, The Late Great Planet Earth. I remember when I became a Christian, everybody was asking everybody, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? Some would say, I'm pan-trib. I just believe Jesus is going to cause it to all pan out in the end. But Christians who live in countries today that are seriously persecuted, Christians in those countries don't ask that question. Uh, it's hard for people in persecuted countries to imagine how things could ever possibly get any worse when your children are being tortured right in front of your eyes. So let's talk about the tribulation this morning. The Bible does give the tribulation period a lot of attention. In fact, there is more information about the tribulation in the Bible than any other eschatological event. For example, Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, all deal with the tribulation. And by far, the largest section devoted to the tribulation period is from Revelation chapter 6, all the way to Revelation chapter 18, all dealing with the tribulation. So, let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, one of the great prophetic passages in all of the scripture, and we're going to walk through this Mount Everest text over the next few times we're together. Matthew 24 is kind of the New Testament power train of all of end time prophecies in the Bible, so many other prophecies in Scripture sink in to Matthew chapter 24. Let's begin this way. We would all agree, I think, that the world needs something. I mean, people may differ over what the world needs, but the world needs a Savior. Answers, hope, deliverance, encouragement. Tony alluded to it in his prayer with the shootings that we're seeing these days. Well, Matthew chapter 24 is the answer. Let's begin in verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away from the temple. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So the temple in Jerusalem was this massive, majestic, magnificent specimen of human architecture rebuilt under King Herod's administration, or rather uh, partially rebuilt and, and expanded. It, it was the former Solomon's temple that had been destroyed 600 years earlier on the exact same site. This is the temple that contained the inner sanctum of the what the Jews called the holy place and the holy of holies. It was the temple that contained the, the thick 
veil that closed off the inner sanctum and, and only the high priest could go behind that veil and only then once a year to offer sacrifices on behalf of the entire nation. That's the veil that was ripped from top to bottom at the moment of Jesus' death to signify that Jesus had opened the way, opened the access into God's presence for anybody who wanted it. In other words, nobody ever again needs a priest or Mary or anybody else to go to God on their behalf because Jesus becomes the mediator and open the door for anybody who wants to, to, to approach the presence of God. That temple was the symbolic presence of God himself. This is where thousands of Passover lambs were slaughtered every Passover. This is where various animal sacrifices were made here throughout the course of the year. There was no more sacred site on planet Earth for the Jewish people than Herod's temple. Herod started this construction about 19 BC and it lasted for 50 years. So it was nearly finished by the time Jesus is walking past it here in Matthew 24, which is why the disciples say to Jesus, what do you think of the reconstruction? And then Jesus drops this bombshell in verse 2. He answered them, you see all of these buildings? Do you not? You can imagine him waving his arm at the sheer size of the temple. And then Jesus says this, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. These disciples didn't see that coming. They are shell-shocked to hear Jesus say this. That would be like standing at the revolving door at the base of the World Trade Center on September the 10th, 2001, looking straight up and marveling at the sheer size of the Twin Towers and somebody coming along and saying, you see all of this? By this time tomorrow, this will all be rubble. Jesus says, there's coming a day when this temple is going to be demolished, reduced to rubble, bulldozed. There's not going to be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That word thrown down signifies that it's going to be ripped down violently. It's going to be bulldozed violently, not because of some design flaw or some material flaw. And that's exactly what happened 40 years later, in 70 AD, when the Roman military turned on Israel like a mad dog and destroyed the entire city of Jerusalem and not one stone of that temple was left on top of another. So that makes the question, well, how come the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is still standing? Isn't that one of the walls of the temple? Well, actually, no, it's not. The Wailing Wall was not one of the temple walls. The Wailing Wall is actually part of a retaining wall that was used to get a flat foundation for the temple because the temple was built on top of a hill that we today call the Temple Mount. So the Temple Mount was kind of uh, curved. And so the Wailing Wall was one of the retaining walls in order to create a level foundation. The Dome of the Rock is built on that very site today. That's the most familiar landmark in any picture that you'll ever see of the Jerusalem skyline, that gold domed roof of the Muslim mosque. So Jesus predicts the violent, utter destruction of that temple 40 years before it happened with 100% accuracy. That's why we admire 
and endure Jesus. Verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, still shell-shocked, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? Well, that's a natural question. When's this going to happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And, second, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, two questions they're asking. When is the temple going to be bulldozed? And what is going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? See, the disciples have made a mistake. They have merged and confused two separate events. They were ill-informed, jumping to conclusions. These two events are separated by 2,000 years, we now know. But they're assuming that the destruction of the temple is going to be so catastrophic that such an event must surely mean that the end of the world, as we know it, is at hand. But of course they were wrong. The temple was destroyed exactly as Jesus predicted, and the world then carried on making history for the next 2,000 years, and of course, still counting. Verse 4, Jesus answered them, so Jesus is now going to answer both of those questions in the rest of Matthew 24. And he does it in one of the most fascinating and brilliant prophetic sermons recorded in the entire Bible. And because we know that he got the first question exactly right, we can be sure that he's going to get the second one exactly right too. So let's carry on and see what Jesus says. First thing he says, see that nobody leads you astray. The two events are not linked. He's giving them a heads up. You're, you're merging these two events, but they're not linked. Don't let anybody lead you astray here. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Future events can cause a lot of confusion. People say a lot of things about the future. But be very careful, Jesus is saying. Be very careful about anybody who claims that they know the future. Because you can be very easily led astray. Verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many people astray. See, a lot of teachers are going to come along and they're going to claim that they have the truth, but be very careful who you believe Jesus is saying. Don't just take people at their word. Don't just take preachers at their word. Just because a preacher says something, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Test their word against the scriptures, the way the Bereans did in Acts 17, 11, when they tested what the Apostle Paul said against Holy Scripture. Be very careful who you trust Jesus is saying. Don't believe everything you hear and read. Because the best of preachers are flawed men with flawed motives, and the worst of them want your money. What a beautiful example Jesus is giving here of his love and his protective care for people. Telling people not to be gullible and not to be naive. The sign of a person that you can trust is a person who tells you to be very careful who you trust. Tells you to check what I'm saying against the scriptures. And now for the rest of the chapter, Jesus is going to now focus primarily on this second question about Jesus' second coming in the end of the age. And in the middle of it, he's going to throw them a bone about the temple. And he's going to answer their question about when the temple is going to be bulldozed. And it's brilliant, fascinating. But you have to look carefully for it. In fact, Matthew even adds an editorial comment when Jesus talks about this, and he says, in brackets, Matthew includes, let the reader understand. In other words, this is where you've got to pay real close attention. So the whole chapter is about 
the tribulation. The pivot point, the epicenter of the entire chapter is verse 21. Here's the words that the disciples are going to remember word for word for the rest of their lives. And they're going to take these words to their grave. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 21. It's very short. For them, there will be great tribulation. Disciples, I'll never forget those words. That's the event that galvanizes this entire chapter. The tribulation is the axle around which the rest of this chapter spins. Jesus coming and the end of the age is going to be marked by something that Jesus calls the great tribulation. And the rest of the chapter, both before verse 21 and after it, basically tells us what's going to happen during the tribulation, what's going to happen before the tribulation, and what's going to happen after it. So let's dive in, we'll get started, and we're not going to finish this today, we'll get as far as we can before we run out of racetrack, and then we'll pick it up next time. Here's the top ten things you want to know about the tribulation. Number one, the tribulation is going to be preceded by lots of signs. There's seven of them, to be exact. And Jesus lists them right here. You cannot find a more accurate prophetic description of the state of the world and the state of the church in the 21st century than in what Jesus says right here. I'm going to give you these seven signs or at least four or five of them this morning. Number one, first sign. There's going to be national and international armed conflicts. That's very clear. Look at verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, that's pretty familiar to all of us. Nobody had ever heard of CNN before the first Gulf War when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. That was the living room war where people first heard the word shock and awe, and where we first heard the term carpet bombing. On the evening news, sitting on the couch. Any of you remember that? I read the other day that America has been at war 93% of the time, 222 out of 242 years since 1776. Today, there's either a war going on somewhere in the world, or there's one threatening to start, or there's one coming to an end. I, you don't need me to tell you that. You know that if you watch the news. Jesus said, see that you're not alarmed. I'm so glad Jesus said that, because that's what wars do. They cause alarm. They cause anxiety. They cause worry, fear, stress. What a beautiful word of strength and encouragement and love from Jesus. Don't let this panic you. God is in control here. Relax. Don't be alarmed by what I'm saying to you. You see, all prophecy is designed to deepen your admiration for Christ. All biblical end-time prophecy is wrapped in the strength and the assurance of the presence of Christ. Any prophetic message that does not include the presence of Christ only produces depression and anxiety and fear. And then Jesus says, don't panic because this must take place. But the end is not yet. Verse 7. For nation is going to rise against nation. Kingdom is going to rise against kingdom. In other words, there's going to be international wars. That describes the two world wars we saw in the 20th century. And as a result of wars, borders are going to shift. Nations are going to be annexed by other nations. So that's the first sign. There's going to be national and international armed conflict. Second sign, Jesus goes on. There's going to be localized catastrophes. Jesus says there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Some of your versions may say in diverse places. That means various places. That's the old spelling of diverse places. 
First time I read that, I thought it was saying that there's going to be earthquakes in swimming pools, in divers' places. Well, as a church, we get calls all the time throughout the year for donations, for relief uh, funds, for famines and earthquakes all over the world. Mary and Alan McLeod have a daughter who works for a relief organization and and she flies all over the world to sites that have been struck by catastrophic events. And there's always some place to go because there's always a catastrophe happening somewhere in the world. <coughs> now, you're probably thinking, but there's always been wars, and there's always been famines, and there's always been catastrophes. Any student of history can tell you that. So how does the proliferation of all of these things mark Jesus' return? Well, it's the frequency and the intensity of them that is significant. Look at verse 8. All these are the beginnings of the birth of pains. Birth pains. Now I don't know about the rest of you men, but I don't know much about giving birth and birth pains. But I have been there when Belinda gave birth four times over. A few times I almost didn't make it, but I was there every time. Now I'm not sure that I was all that helpful, the first time when Belinda was getting near the end, she was making lots of noise and hurting my ears, and I said to her, surely it can't be that bad. <laughs> and she said something to me right there that is unrepeatable, and I have blocked it from my memory anyway, so I can't even remember what it was she said. But I can say two things about birth contractions. Number one, the contractions become more painful the closer they get to D-Day, delivery day. And second, the closer you get to the big moment, the more frequently they happen. So while history has been no stranger to wars and famines and earthquakes, the closer Jesus' return gets, the more intense or painful these signs are going to become and the more frequently they're going to happen. Just like birth contractions. So Jesus goes on with some more signs that will pave the way for the tribulation. Third, hatred for Christ and Christianity and Christians and the church is going to rise. Look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. That's an intensifying sign in our day. Christianity is targeted these days in our culture, in our Canadian culture. You may or may not be feeling very much of that depending on the circles that you travel in, but I assure you it is here. It's in Canada, and it's alive and well. We have the hate without much of the severe persecution. Now, this is not meant to panic you. Jesus said, do not be alarmed by these things. The world is what it is. Canada is what it is. I, I, I can't say what's not true. That's just the way our country is. This is meant to strengthen you, to assure you that the Bible is true and Jesus is worthy of your love and devotion and admiration, no matter the state of the world. But Christianity is hated today. Many of the values that the Bible teaches are on a collision course with the changing values of the culture. I don't want to overstate this or overgeneralize this here, but our culture talks a lot about tolerance and respect and kindness. But in my experience, here's what I've noticed. These attitudes of tolerance and respect and kindness do not extend to anybody 
who believes the Bible's values and does not embrace the culture's values. This collision of values, for example, shows up in discussions about the origins of the universe. Anything other than a belief in evolution is shut down. The issue of abortion and when life begins and a woman's rights versus the baby's rights. And in the sexual preference issue and sexual identity issue and in sex education of children and in the definition of marriage and what the Bible says about other world religions. Bible and culture are on a collision course. Put another way, the values of the Bible and the values of the culture are on different planets. Even when Christians express their belief in the Bible and disagree with the values of the culture with humility and love and kindness, without being judgmental, without superiority attitudes, without pride, which, by the way, is the only way a Christian ought to express their disagreement. <coughs> They're still hated. The Bible is hated because the Bible is exclusive. But truth, by its very nature, is exclusive. If the Bible is true, it has to be exclusive because if one is right, all others have to be wrong. But Christians increasingly are not going to be allowed to respectfully and lovingly disagree. And they simply won't be tolerated. They are going to be hated and muzzled and forced speech laws are going to govern what preachers can and can't preach from the Bible and they'll face jail times for violation. <coughs> but Jesus says, see that you're not alarmed by all of this. I'm here. It's okay. Trust me. Follow me. Obey me. Worship me. Admire me. You just keep your eyes fixed on me. I'm telling you all of this so that you know that I know the future. It's all under control. It's in the Father's hands. Number four, apostasy in the church is going to increase. People who come to church and profess to know Jesus are going to fall away. They're going to give up. That's what apostasy means. Look at verse 10. Many will fall away. That means many who claim to be Christians will fall away. But it gets worse. They will betray one another and they will hate one another. This one is particularly heartbreaking. Many Christians who say they're followers of Jesus are going to fall away, presumably for the same reasons that Jesus gave in the parable of the four soils. The condition of the heart and what it does with the word. Some hearts are going to be like hard pathway soil. And the, the seed of the word's just not going to penetrate. They're, they're not going to study the word. They're not going to read the word. They're not going to open the Bible except when they come to church on Sundays. So the, the word never gets into their heart. They'll just blow away in the world when, when a wind comes. And Jesus said they will be easy prey for Satan. Satan will just pluck the seed out of their heart the way a birdie does with the seed that's sown along the path. Other types of hearts are going to be like thorny soil and the seed of the word is going to get choked by the weeds and thorns of life's problems. Other hearts are going to be like the rocky soil where the root is not going to go down deep and, and when the heat of trouble and difficulty and pressure and stress and persecution comes, it's going to scare them off. And sadly, Jesus says, that's when they will betray the true believers because now they're going to have insider information about who attends the church and who are true followers of Jesus and they're going to become government informants and whistleblowers. That happens all the time to Christians in countries where following Christ is illegal. 
And that's going to cause a lot of hatred. Christians are going to be ridiculed by family members and, and some of them are even going to be despised in some occasions. And the church is going to get infected with this and nobody's going to trust anybody anymore and there's going to be a lot of hate even inside the church and there's going to be hate from without and there's going to be hate from within. And it's going to be awful. But there's one you can trust. Don't be alarmed because there's one you can trust. I'll give you another one. False teachers are going to rise up. Look at verse 11. Many false prophets, false teachers, are going to arise, and they will lead many astray. Now, Jesus said exactly the same thing in verse 5, six verses earlier. So he started with that, and now here he is bringing it up again. So that means this is a big problem. TV is full of these kinds of TV evangelists who preach their opinions and not the scriptures. Or they teach parts of the scriptures that preach easily, that tickle the ears. The, these preachers are very likable. And thousands are going to flock to listen to them. Jesus says, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So thousands of people are going to flock to listen to these guys. We call these, a lot of these churches mega churches. That doesn't mean that all of them are like that, but some are. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.3, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll only listen to preachers that make them feel good. False teachers want your money. Peter says that in 2 Peter 2. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. And it's not just their teaching that's a problem that displays their, that they are false teachers. It's also their lifestyle. They don't teach lordship, and they don't teach that Jesus is Lord, and they don't practice Jesus is Lord. Peter said in 2 Timothy 2, false teachers will arise among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them. So false teachers deny or they don't teach the lordship of Christ or admiration and loyalty and obedience to the majesty of Christ, above all, that he is master and we are to be his loyal, obedient servants. They're just, false teachers don't teach that. In fact, a false teacher might even teach sound doctrine, but live with a secret immorality because they've got a dark side. And they don't preach lordship or integrity in their private world. That's why you hear of so many church leaders on the evening news getting into moral scandals and, and they blow up the church. False teachers. Now, Jesus gives two more signs that are going to lead up to the tribulation, but we've run out of time, so we'll pick those up next time. Let me finish this way. Anybody who watches the news and has any awareness of the things that are going on in our culture and in our world today, knows that the world needs something. And nobody's got it. Nobody has ever lived a life like Christ. He's the only one who can fix the world's problems. And when he comes back, he will. And only those who believe in Christ, are going to be ready. And I don't mean just intellectual belief. It's real belief that is evidenced by behavioral change. In John 8, Jesus makes that clear. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, that's what John says in John 8, 
Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So they believed. But then Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Just because a person says, I believe in Jesus, doesn't mean they are a true believer. The proof of the pudding is getting a fork load of it into your mouth or something. It's always amazed me over the years to see so many people so diligent in planning for retirement, yet never think about eternity. Never consult the best-selling book in the world on the subject of how to be ready for eternity. And Jesus asked a very penetrating question. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We exalt your holy, mighty, all-powerful name. We thank you that in a world where there is such uncertainty, there are some things that remain unchanged and certain. Your word is true. You are in control. Jesus lives. Life is short, but heaven is real. Help us today through the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. Help us to live life confidently, full of hope, full of joy and love and peace. And Lord, if there is anybody here today who's alarmed and does not know Christ, give them faith to believe, to really believe in Christ, and that they would see that belief evidenced in a transformed life as they follow him forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.